across the fence the unwelcome return of a pest to Vermont forests. We'll assess the threat and find out what's being done to protect trees from this latest outbreak. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Last year, forest tent caterpillars defoliated 25,000 acres of forest land in the state. What makes these pests a concern is what they like to eat, the leaves of sugar maples and other hardwoods that make up a majority of Vermont forests. Most trees bounce back after being stripped bare by these hungry caterpillars, but consecutive years of defoliation in addition to other forest pests and diseases make this latest outbreak a threat to the green of our Green Mountain. To update us on the damage from these insects, we've asked Josh Hallman to join us. Josh is a forest health specialist with the Vermont Department of Forests, Parks and Recreation. Thanks so much for being here. My pleasure. So tell us about this year's infestation of forest tent caterpillars. So this is the second year of an outbreak that we have in the state right now. Um, forest tent caterpillar, as you mentioned, feeds on hardwood foliage, predominantly sugar maple and ash. Um, and what we're seeing is actually similar to what we saw last year in that large tracts of forest are being defoliated by this insect. Um, last year we mapped approximately 25,000 acres of damage mm -hmm. and this year um, we're just beginning to start the assessment of how much defoliation has occurred throughout the state um, but we are seeing the outbreak move to different areas of the state. Last year it was confined to the north central and northeastern part of the state and this year we're already seeing it move a little further west into Franklin County um, and further south as well. So um, feeding of this insect typically occurs throughout the month of June. Mm -hmm. So we are actually nearing the end of the, the feeding season um, for the insect, but we are seeing impacts on the landscape. Well, let's back up just a little bit. What are forest tent caterpillars and what's the main concern about them? Sure, so forest tent caterpillars are a native insect that we have in Vermont. Uh, they've evolved with the species that live here and so they're typically ar around and, and what you see in the picture here is one of the forest tent caterpillars, the hallmark of which is this white keyhole pattern on the back of it mm -hmm. uh, and some blue coloration on the sides as well. And as I mentioned, it's native, so it has been here in low levels, but occasionally it gets into these outbreak levels. And what we've seen in Vermont is it's roughly every 10 years or so we, we get an outbreak. Um, and this is what you typically see in an outbreak, are these clusters of forest tent caterpillars that are um, coming together to, it's sort of like a social behavior there. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that's a common misnomer about forest tent caterpillars is that it, it makes a tent. The fact is it does not make a tent. Yeah, right. It's a separate caterpillar that right. does that, which looks very different. Um, it's, so there aren't the tents to contend with. Correct. Yeah. And so um, what are the impacts of defoliation on trees in the short term and then also on the long term? Sure. So I mean, it's very dramatic to see. <laughs> it is, especially in, in full stands that have been defoliated. Um, the light can come completely through the canopy, um, as you see here on a hillside in northern Vermont, um, so that it's, it's bright and sunny. But in the short term, the trees are, they lose their leaves. Right. So that's not, that picture doesn't show like fog or anything on top. That's the fact that those trees don't have any leaves on exactly. them anymore. Exactly, that's the absence of foliage there. Mm -hmm. um, but the trees, as you can see here, they, they lose their leaves and given normal growing conditions and, and proper soil nutrition, they actually will put out another flush of foliage later in the season so that they can continue to photosynthesize. But it does impact the tree uh, in terms of how much photosynthate it can make that year, uh, carbohydrate storage, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. What's the cycle of this? particular outbreak? Um, so the last outbreak we had was in, began in 2004. This one began last year. Um, so the cycle of it is about a 10 year lag between those outbreaks. Mm -hmm. We expect these outbreaks to typically last between two to six years throughout the state. Mm -hmm. In a given site, we, we routinely do, do not see more than one to three years of defoliation in a given site though. So what, if anything, can the Department of Forest, Parks and Recreation do about the outbreak? Well, what we do is, Yearly, we actually monitor for the pest. We set out traps and try and predict uh, whether or not the population is building or not to that outbreak status. Um, and following that, we are able to actually uh, fly over the state. This is where some of these images that you're seeing here come from is when we fly throughout the state to map forest damage and we document the coverage of this. Um, finally, in the fall, when the leaves are off, for sugar makers, we're able to help with what's called an egg mass survey to quantify the amount of egg masses in the trees to perhaps predict defo defoliation the following spring so that landowners can manage their property adequately. Mm -hmm. Now, when you talk about manage proper 
uh, manage the property adequately. Mm -hmm. um, that goes back to what you were saying, is even if these caterpillars strip the trees, there's still some things that can be done that'll keep the trees healthy. Yes, so um, folks can do a number of things depending on the type of land that you have. Uh, maintaining a diverse forest is a really good step, obviously, because these don't eat all hardwoods. Red maple is not eaten by this species. Um, some, if you have conifers in there too, it helps reduce the ability of the population to build. Um, alternatively, if you are in a sugar bush where uh, you do have large populations building and you're concerned about your crop, you do have the option to uh, engage in a spray program mm -hmm. to, to treat your sugar bush so that the foliage is saved. Let's take a look at sort of the, the, what the forest tent caterpillar looks like versus the other caterpillar that some sure. people the confuse eastern it tent? with. Yes. Yeah, the eastern tent caterpillar. So what you're seeing here on the left is, again, that keyhole formation. But the eastern tent caterpillar on the right has that long white stripe down it. And, mm -hmm. and that is actually that caterpillar that makes tents in, in branch crotches of typically fruit trees, apples, pears. Right. And you'll see that webbing. Yes, absolutely. And once again, just to remind people, if you see that, don't burn it. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> um, is there some place where folks can get some more information? Yeah, they can get onto our website at fpr.vermont.gov mm -hmm. and click the links through Forest Health. And we have a, a large um, suite of documents that, that discuss the biology, the management, um, and what to expect in the coming year. All right, well, thanks so much for joining us. Sure, my pleasure. All right, well, last summer, Vermont celebrated a forest first when the Hinesburg Town Forest was officially listed on the National Register of Historic Places. It was the first time a town forest had received such a distinction. The 837 acres of the Hinesburg Town Forest are now considered a historic landscape with a tradition of stewardship and conservation. To learn more, Across the Fences, Rebecca Gollin spoke with the UVM grad student who spearheaded the effort. I'm Sarah Gralty. I'm an architectural historian and a preservation consultant. I live in Portland, Maine now, but I used to live in Burlington. I am a 2007 graduate of the master's program in historic preservation at UVM. What is your history with working with the Heinsberg Forest? So when I was a grad student, when I was at UVM, I knew about the town forest and I loved coming here and you know hiking and, and enjoying the place. But it wasn't until I took a class with Bob McCullough at UVM that I learned about the really interesting history of this place. Um, this is a place that has an agricultural history that I'd sort of come across when I was hiking through the paths and you find the cellar holes and these other um, cool old remnants of this agricultural past. But um, I didn't really understand what the history of a town forest was or what um, municipal forestry was about until that class with, with Bob. And so I met with the town of Heinsberg, did research, read about the um, history and context of town forests, learned about um, the forest management. I have a background in art history and architectural history, so learned some, you know, had to explore some, some new areas of interest and knowledge. So Sarah, the Heinsberg Town Forest recently received an honor. What was that honor and who made it? Yeah, so this summer, 2016, the town forest was officially listed on the National Register of Historic Places. So working with Bob McCullough, Devin Coleman at the state, um, I, I wrote and developed this nomination um, form, which is then submitted to the state, who then submits it um, to Washington to the National Park Service. The National Register is the official list of our nation's um, places that are considered um, important for preservation. And um, I think as of right now, there are over 90,000 official listings on the National Register all across all 50 states and all sorts of different types of resources. So um, the National Park Service makes the final decisions and, and maintains the, the National Register. Up until the summer, um, there were no town forests listed on the National Register. This is, this is the first one to be um, officially, individually listed on the National Register. What does it mean for a place like this to be listed on the National Register? Listing on the National Register is purely honorific. It's a way to highlight um, a great place. It doesn't mean that this doesn't sort of um, put up a velvet rope or mothball this place. I mean, that, that was so counter to what this place is. The, this is a, a living vernacular landscape with one of the most important components um, that we talked about in the nomination was that this is an actively managed forest. And so it requires you know, current management practices. And all, there are all these um, component uh, forest 
forest landscapes, stands of different trees and tree types and um, interesting uh, examples of different sort of um, approaches to forest management uh, over many decades. And so, of course, those resources are changing and growing, um, and that's the nature of this, this forest. So um, by no means does, this, does, does the listing in any way stop um, the town forest from being this, this active this active landscape. It is more just to draw attention to this is a really cool and important place here in, in Heinsberg. What are some of the things that you like the best about the Heinsberg Town Forest? Oh, it's hard to choose a favorite. I first loved this place because I used to come and walk around with friends and it's beautiful. And so I would walk and I would, I would look around on the ground and try to find all these old cellar holes because I thought, oh, that's what makes this place cool. There were all these farms here and, and you can kind of find a cellar hole and then know that nearby there's probably a barn footing maybe and sort of put those pieces together like a, like a history mystery. I think my preservation friends and I I love finding those kind of history mysteries. But um, so if you'd asked me at the beginning of the project, that's what I might have said. But since then, really learning what a town forest is and learning how to, how to sort of apply um, a reading of a landscape, reading this as a, as a, as a, it's a cultural landscape and it's also, um, you know, it's a forest. And so learning how to read the components of this place as sort of markers of the history of this landscape has been so fascinating to me. To be able to look at a, a stand of trees and to see that they're all planted really linearly and, you, and very, very bound in a really geometric shape. And to, to compare that to right next door is a totally different type of tree or type of um, organization of the landscape. Or, and, then, and then think about how did that happen? And, and that history comes from, um, there was civilian conservation core plantings that happened here, and that's a lot of these, um, these linear plantings. And then um, you can sort of realize how the different parcels were developed because it was a slower, it was sort of, it was a 20 year process for Heinsberg to acquire these parcels. So different parcels were forested or planted at different times. And so if you go and you walk through the forest now, you can notice the difference in the, the, the trees and the age of trees or the type of species or, you know, the canopy feels different. But you can also look on the ground and often notice um, the the borders between all the former par parcels, which are often marked with low stone walls, which are often sort of on a north-south or east-west axis. And, and that's a shadow of the previous agricultural history in this landscape. Eight years, a lot of work. This must be pretty personally rewarding for you. Oh, How yeah. do you feel about it? This is great. This is the first time I've been back to the forest today since the, since the um, nomination was approved and, and the listing took place this summer. Um, yeah, I, this project is so, so important and, and so, so personal to me. Um, the, the history of this place is something that is so multi-layered and so fascinating. And to be able to just do a, a, a deep dive into the history of, of, a, of a place that you really love and learn that you can love it even more because of the history um, that you didn't even realize was there um, is already so rewarding. And then to actually be, um, to have that, have that own sort of personal interest be, be appreciated and confirmed by, by someone else. And, and I, I couldn't be happier that this, that this went through and it was, um, it was a, a long process, but it was really great and a really, really, really fun time and a really good collaboration between um, the University of Vermont Historic Preservation Program and Bob McCullough and um, the state, Devin Coleman and the, um, the Division for Historic Preservation and the town who really already valued and, and they, knew, they knew how great this place was and they wanted everybody else to, to know too. So um, all these great forces and, and lots of other people too, but great forces came together. And so it's really, it's really great. It's really something to be here and to be, to be able to celebrate this as an official, official National Register property. Well, our thanks to Sarah Gralty for taking the time to share and explain the Heinsberg Town Forest story. And thank you for joining us. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence. <laughs>